Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Castlevania Legacy of Darkness playthrough. And we are continuing our exploration of the Not Spencer Mansion. Which, even though it is clearly modeled after the Spencer Mansion, only has one direction that you can possibly go, because the other door downstairs is locked. Also, the hallways are way too wide. What the hell's <laughs> up with the 2D paper man? <laughs> oh, I, I, it's, it's actually pretty neat, though, because, like, so they're, they're, they're soldiers that form from broken... Window glass. Yeah. I thought that was something that only Medieval did. There, there, there's a, an enemy like that in um, Haunted Castle, actually, uh, which I know because of the remake. What? There there was. It, that's it, right. A, yeah. I can't. Yeah. I, I, I want to say, like, at the time of this recording, the 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 3DS, oh, the DS collection was uh, revealed and released, and I'm so happy about that. However, like, the unsung champion of that was the remake of Haunted Castle that nobody asked for, but is nevertheless appreciated because now we have a good version of that. Is game. that a brand new remake, like, yeah. for that collection? It's it's essentially Castle. You remember Castlevania Rebirth on, on WiiWare yeah. or whatever the fuck it was? It's that like it's it's essentially a remake in the in lieu of that style. But they they just released that brand new for no reason. Like I don't know why they. It's, yeah, it's a it's a part as of an extra in the Dominus for. collection. Yeah, it was a really cool yeah. inclusion, you know. So like it that it, like the three DS games together on their own would have been a fantastic value package for twenty five dollars. Yeah, no, but, it, um, trying to get even just one of them. A couple of years back, I went through the effort of trying to get. All of the dude i the bought ds game i bought a card only no box no manual version of order of ecclesia literally right before that fucking collection came out it was twenty dollars on its own and that was after price hunting <laughs> yeah that was that was sounds similar to what i did as well um portrait of ruin also wasn't cheap either and i'm pretty sure the version i got was is bootlegged because i know that game's glitchy my my copy's really glitchy so uh it could just be regular portion of Ruin. Uh no, I, I sent you a, a clip of it at one point where I was in one of the menus and my DS was perfectly mm. fine at the time, and it was just like cycling through the menus as if I was holding down one of the buttons. Oh yeah. So I think my version might be bootlegged uh, of Portrait of Ruin. Uh, but yeah, no, um they are a gr I'm just surprised that they felt the need to do that for that collection. I would have thought that like the the one that they eventually yeah. make that has like the Game Boy games on them would get something like that. To... That's kind of where I'm at though, it, like because so Castlevania Rebirth, the first one is a remake of Castlevania the Adventure, uh, the Game Boy yeah. game, and for them to go backwards to make a Haunted Castle remake is strange, but at the same time still appreciate it. At but to go back to what we were talking about in an earlier part. Can we remake Castlevania Legends <laughs> with that That style? would be nice. Um, I mean, Legends is better than the adventure, but it's still kind of a mediocre game in the end. Um, yes. It, it would be cool to see Sonya Belmont again. Just, just going to say. Agreed. I mean, you know, if you have to rework her part in the story to make her canon or whatever, fine. Just, you know, bring the character back. Just fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> there are fan remakes of, uh, of Legends uh, that um, that look pretty cool. And we almost got a second game with her. They were going to do the same studio. In fact, was was making yep. a uh, another three D Castlevania game on the Dreamcast. It got axed not because the game was necessarily bad, but because the Dreamcast was dead. Um, it, like Castlevania on Gen on Sega things are just cursed because like after Bloodlines, that's it. That's all you're getting. <laughs> you got you had a failed thirty two X game uh, that would never saw the light of day. And they tried to get with the Dreamcast. It's like this shit is not working. We're just going back to the PlayStation. Yeah. Old school Konami had a an admirable but perhaps perhaps misguided um, uh, philosophy of supporting every possible platform under the sun, which is why their series are so scattered across multiple platforms. That's why we got a remake of Castlevania One on the fucking sharp whatever number. It's why we got Bloodline uh, X Sharp sixty eight. Yeah, the thousand. How do you remember that shit, man? <laughs> <laughs> because I had to look at it a lot when I was reviewing Castlevania Chronicles. Okay, fair. Um, it's why we had a, uh, a unique Genesis game. They did the same thing with with uh, Rocket Knight, if I remember. And um, that's did right, uh, Sparkster. It's why it's why we had a Genesis specific Contra game called Hardcore. Um, uh, what were you asking, Ted? Uh, was uh, Rocket Knight uh, Konami? Uh, I'm pretty sure it was Konami. Uh, uh, 
A good question, actually. Hold on, let me take a look. But, like... It's also why, like... Uh, let us see. Uh, it was published by... Okay, no, so the Rocket Knight re-release was published by Konami. Uh, but, Rock, yeah, Rocket Knight is uh, is Konami. Okay, yeah, I thought it was Konami. But <laughs> why, why was there Rocket Knight Adventures in Sparkster? Like because Konami had a philosophy of making unique games for unique platforms. And they were not alone in that, to be fair. But it was just how they they developed things. That's why instead of doing another uh, a port of Castlevania One for the MSX, they made a separate game with by, they had a separate team make a separate game called Vampire Killer, um, which had a completely different mm -hmm. gameplay style but reused a lot of assets. It makes sense when you think about how porting was back then versus now, where the PS4, Five, and Xbox X versions of a game are going to be fairly similar because they're effectively running on the same engine. You know, they're yeah, all... Yeah, they're running on slightly different PC hardware is what they're running on. Yeah, um. but uh, when you come to, you know, back then, where the MSX and the SNES and the PS1 are all extremely different machines that can't port the same game, uh, you might have... It, it's not really that much work to make something brand new from scratch and make it different versus trying to remake the same game again oh, but yeah. for different hardware. Like uh, hardware hardware and software differences were so stark back then that PCs actually had a hard ass time trying to get screen scrolling to work, but they could do three they could do like those first person maze dungeon styles that you would see in Wizardry and Ultima which 8-bit consoles couldn't do or at least they thought 8-bit consoles couldn't do it until Yuji Naka got it working for Fantasy Star at the very tail end of the generation. But Oh, yeah, know. that's... Uh, did Shin Megami... Did, no, not Shin Megami Tensei. This would have been the original Megami Tensei, I believe, is also a really late title on the Famicom that did that kind of screen, first-person dungeon crawling. Uh, but did it do But too. did it do it smoothly? <laughs> uh, I mean, probably not. I, I'm not a... <laughs> original Megami Tensei for the NES expert. <laughs> so, I mean, consider, considering that the SNES version's not all that smooth either, I'd say probably not. Uh, hold on. Is this dude who I think he is? It, this Jean Reno looking fellow is the... Yeah, I was going to say, is this a Jean <laughs> Reno reference? Because his name is Renaud and he looks kind of like Jean Reno. He looks like he's just going to work, like... <laughs> He's a hitman. I believe he <laughs> so is, but you know the, the the hitman look is not inconsequential to what actually ends up happening with this guy. He is our shopkeeper. Um, you we can spend gold to buy stuff at this shop. On normal mode, you don't really need to unless you're really new, like I was on this playthrough. But you know, um, he's there. There's a catch, <laughs> however. You are doing business with a with a self admitted demon, and that goes about as well as you would expect. Spend thirty thousand gold or more, and you have to fight him as a boss before Dracula. So, uh, wow, the, what, the Dick. <laughs> oh, Rodan. I and guess. I don't know if this is nece necessarily true in Carrie's or Cornell's playthrough because I skip over him there. But he's like uh, an amped up version of Death in this ver in this campaign, at the very least. So, wow, what an what an asshole though. You it's like, okay, I'm going to go to KFC. Oh, congratulations. You spent enough uh money here. And instead of giving you like a rewards card or free lunch, instead they punch you in the stomach. What an asshole. What he ends up saying is that you signed a contract with with Satan that if you that if you spent more than 30,000 gold your soul is forfeit. Um he literally says that by the way. There's none of that religious censorship going on here. So that's nice. We get to call crosses crosses now. Okay. So uh, the one item that you can only really get from Renan is the healing kit, which I think cures status ailments, but also does 100% healing. Um, 
There's only like one candle in the game, I think, that, that can drop a healing kit as an item, and it's the candle hidden behind Dracula's throne room in the final stage. Um, and it will only drop a healing kit, or at least it only dropped a healing kit for me when I had no healing kits in my inventory, so you might not even get it in your own playthrough. Is there another shop, or is that the only shop in the game? Um, you, you find scroll, you, you find the contract scrolls, scrolls scattered around the levels, sometimes near save points, sometimes in random out of the way locations. Um, and you can access Renan's shop from any of them. Oh, okay. But there's no shop that doesn't sell your soul to the devil. Uh, no, no. Is more what I mean. <laughs> he is okay. the only shopkeeper. <laughs> What are your wares? Oh, I think you misunderstand. I'm looking to buy something from you. We don't get any well-meaning fat priest from the local church. We don't get Dominique or or um, or a friendly alchemist. We don't get um, uh, what was it in Symphony of the Night? The librarian? I think it was the librarian. Uh, yeah, the librarian. Well, the, the librarian is the one who sold stuff. Yeah. And I I always liked Hunter and Arya of Sorrow, and then. Was that his name, Hunter? Hammer. Hammer. Was Hammer. His name. Hammer. Yeah. His name was Hammer. Yeah. Uh, and then in uh, Dawn of Sorrow, he turns into an anime uh, trope. He turns uh, into an anime pervert who's just drooling over Yoko. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's kinda despite like, being literally twice her age, um, Dawn of Sorrow likes to do turn formally, maybe not deep characters, but at least interesting characters into anime tropes, and yeah. it, it makes me sad. It's it's irritating, but you know, speaking of. Arya and Dawn of Sorrow. Before Igarashi uh, uh, gave us Soma, Castlevania 64 played with a very similar idea in the form of Malice here. The difference between Malice and Soma is that uh, Dracula's servants actually knew to look for a kid who would reincarnate as Dracula. So they took all the children from the local villages to the castle all at once because they did not know which, um, which kid would actually be Dracula. Malice oh, is that's, the one. That's yeah. the plot of Dragon Quest IV. Um, so, um, here's the thing, though. This plot about them kidnapping all the local children was mentioned and then never mentioned again in the original Castlevania 64. Here it kind of gets some closure because it's the subject of Henry Mode. Henry Mode is a sort of speedrunning scavenger hunt in which you have a game-breaking gun as your main attack, and you have to go through... Um, six different levels in a sort of open-ended order trying to find all the kids who are who are who have been kidnapped there so uh that's a thing anyway this maze is fucking annoying and it took me a while to actually figure out what i'm supposed to do here oh do the dogs not die the dogs don't die no does that frankenstein monster have a chainsaw arm that's badass yes okay Interesting thing about this guy, okay, the gardener, Frankenstein's monster with a chainsaw arm, is sort of repurposed from the intended fourth character who never got made. Not even in this version. The original fourth campaign was not supposed to be Henry's quest to find a bunch of missing children. You were supposed to play as a different character called Collar. And yeah, this took a while. Uh, I'm, um, I didn't actually realize what I was supposed to do. But anyway... Uh, Collar would have been our fourth character, which sounds like metal as hell. Like, we would be playing as Frankenstein's monster, on top of playing as a werewolf and a Belmont and, uh, Maria XP. <laughs> so, like, they had some good ideas for this shit. And, uh, I kinda, like, wish we lived in a world where they actually got to finish this fucking game. But, you know, that's the story of our lives as Sonic fans, isn't it? <laughs> no, uh, the story of our lives as Sonic fans is I hope this next game's good. So it, it's actually funny. When you said that, oh, the final boss is Malice, uh, I thought it was like Malice as in, oh, ill intent. And I was like, oh, that's actually badass. I know it's Malice. Like, oh, Mal, it's us. Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's supposed to it's supposed to um, evoke the name, the, the word Malice in English. But, um, you know, they spelled it different so that it would believably work as a name oh uh, yeah well if you run into the crying child in dracula's castle and his name is malice m-i-l-i-c-e you're gonna be wait a minute <laughs> mm. <laughs> at the same time though 
your first question upon meeting someone is, okay, how's that spelled? <laughs> because if you tell me how it's spelled, I'll know the intent behind your name. Well, if you ask me how your name's spelled, then I'm going to think you're an Ace Attorney villain. Because that's the one thing that I remember is that the <laughs> second Ace Attorney game, you get the criminal because he didn't know. He tried to frame someone and didn't know how to spell their name. So it's like, oh, yeah. yeah my, my, my favorite my favorite criminal to prosecute in Ace Attorney was always... I am the killer. I am the killer. <laughs> like, how do we not Hello, know? Hello, my name is Mr. Burns. I believe you have it's a letter for me. <laughs> really weird once I get to the Ace Attorney Investigations 2 official translation. Because as someone who played the fan translation way back, um, they also did their own pun names. But the new version has different pun names. So now I'm going to be very confused as to which character they're talking about. <laughs> I don't understand. Anyway, um, so the gardener triggers automatically as soon as the dogs are triggered. But <laughs> you can find him in the maze and he starts chasing you, like, without prompting. Yeah, he's just, he's just trying to do his job and you're provoking him, man. Leave him alone. <laughs> this guy is around way back in Cornell's story, like, 20 fucking years ago. Uh, I think it's more like eight. I don't know. I think it's eight years ago. But he's, like, Don't he's, reference, like, though. still here. It's like a, it's a, it's this game's Frankenstein or yeah. Frankenstein's creature. Yeah, uh, but it's also an, another Evil Dead reference. Yeah, but like I but like I said, it it was it it was a, it was repurposed from a character that was intended to be playable. Can now, you kill this guy or is he invincible? You can you can knock him down and stun him, a bit like Nemesis. <laughs> was not, that was not ready for the press. Actually, <laughs> you know, he functions a lot more like Mister X in the Resident Evil Two remake, although just for this like one little area. Fuck, could you imagine Mr. X with a chainsaw arm? He also rubber bands like a motherfucker, like... Seriously, dude. Oh my god, Anyways, look at I can see him zooming, wow. Yeah, yeah, like, he's got some speed, like, holy shit. Now, um, this would be a good time to mention how sub-weapons work in this game. There are four, you know, every one of the classic sub-weapons except the stopwatch. Stopwatch would have been badass in this situation, though. It probably would be very broken in a 3D game, though, I would imagine, because you could just walk around every enemy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so instead of the stopwatch, we got the sun and moon cards. But the other four sub-weapons are, are present and accounted for. The, like, the knives do barely any damage. The axes are good, but they arc and have a tendency to hit, to hit ceilings. And then there's the, the, uh, the cross boomerang. Which um, can hit multiple targets before um, before it uh, gives up. So that's nice. But the champion of the show is the fucking holy water, which is, as usual, absolutely disgustingly powerful, especially in Legacy of Darkness. Because unlike in the original Castlevania 64, you can upgrade your sub weapons by picking up multiples of the same one. They can level up to stage three, and if you get stage three in any weapon, except the knife, which is always terrible, um, you can uh, you can do some like really cool you you can do some really cool uh, additional effects, like the axe causes like lightning explosions and shit. It's great. Wasn't that a thing in Super Castlevania, or am I? I think it might have been another thing from Bloodlines, but I'm not sure. Um, oh, what are we referring to? The upgrading sub weapons was that in a two D game? Uh, the only game that comes to mind of upgrading sub weapons is Portrait of Ruin. Ah, oh yeah, uh, because... which is not cla which is not classic Vania, but it's still two D. You mean the mastery system? Mm hmm. Yeah. Fuck that shit. <laughs> it was repetitive as hell. Uh, it was better than grinding souls in Dawn of Sorrow. No, it wasn't. It was a no. It was exactly the same thing. I, I mean, I didn't bother with it, so um, <laughs> I'll take your word for it, but I thought it... The only sub-weapons that have, like, a reasonably fast track to mastery are the few sub-weapons that you can buy in shops. Because if you buy a duplicate sub-weapon in a shop, you get 10 mastery points toward that sub-weapon. You do not get those 10 mastery points with a, with a sub-weapon if you pick up a duplicate that drops from an enemy, which is bullshit. Ugh. <sighs> Okay. Oh, god damn it. Anyway, so to get the dogs off you, you have to use your secondary weapon because they latch onto your main arm so you can't use your whip. The um 
The other thing, though, is that you're supposed to follow Malice through the maze. So if you lose Malice, <laughs> you'll just run around like a headless chicken the way I did. <laughs> Literally headless because this guy's got to cut your head off. Yeah, and like... You won't know you won't know where to go, but you're supposed to follow him down this side of the maze. Except he pulls a trick and like ducks down like under an impassable little like slot in the in the hedge maze. So you actually have to go around to find him again. Um, the other thing though is that okay, I said they tightened up the game's controls in an earlier part. What I did not say was exactly how they did that. In the original version of the game you would immediately gain speed the moment you jumped forward. Instantaneously, you would gain your full horizontal momentum. You still gain speed while jumping in this game, in this version of the game, but but it happens gradually as you arc up into the air, so it's a lot less slippery when jumping over narrow platforms and shit. The downside is you don't gain the speed immediately, so this part of the game is a lot harder <laughs> than it used to be. <laughs> um, in the original Castlevania 64, you can just jump through the entire hedge maze and the dogs will never catch you. They straight up will never be able to touch you. Here, you can still sort of avoid them by jumping, but you have to time the jump pretty precisely to manage it. So uh, my first run through the maze was pretty pitiful. I'll do better as Carrie, I promise. I promise I would also do better as Cornell, but Cornell actually has a substantially different villa stage. Anyway, yeah. So I love this cutscene because we just walk Malice to the gate, and he's like, you can go through the forest, watch watch for the demons. And if you're playing as Reinhardt, he's like, you're a man, you can do it. <laughs> I was just like, what? Come on. I mean, you still do the same thing with Henry and Cornell's campaign, but Cornell at least gives him a magic amulet so that he'll be magically protected by wolves. And you actually hear Henry talk about how the wolves protected him during the ending scene. Here it's just like, Ma uh, 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 Reinhardt and Kerry take Malice to the gate, and they're just like, yeah, okay, if you run from here, you can probably get to safety. Just watch out for the demons in the forest, because those are dangerous, man. That kid's like nine. <laughs> 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 it's just, it's just like, what the hell? Uh. And yeah, this 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 um this hallway is kind of like obnoxiously empty afterward too. Not in Cornell's campaign though. Cornell gets to fight skeletons on motorcycles here. In the 1800s? Yeah. <laughs> skeletons on motorcycles. In the original game, the skeletons on motorcycles actually debuted during the first boss fight against the giant skeleton, actually. Um, well, not the first round, but the one at the end of the level. You Like, there would be two skeletons on motorcycles at the very start of the boss fight. Just for no reason. Skeletons on does motorcycles. The, does the giant skeleton get a motorcycle? No. He can't. <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> the skeletons on motorcycles are one of the more fun enemies in this game, but um, they're also one of the more irritating enemies because they appear during the nitro section. I think that section of the game needs no introduction because it's the one James Rolfe made famous. Although, we'll be talking about that when we get to it because he kind of misrepresented it, like, badly. I'm sure Castlevania 64 has never recovered. <laughs> like, well, I mean, then. it honestly hasn't. <laughs> it's it, the thing people know the game for the most. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's like, it's not nearly as bad as he portrayed it. In fact, it's not bad at all. It's weird. I expected to hate it when I got there, you know? But, um... Did he play this version or the? He I, played it's been so long since I watched. He video. played the original version, but you know that level, the castle center, is actually one of the ones that was changed the least between the two versions, and the nitro section is pretty much the same. The only differences I can think of is that a few specific is that one specific enemy was removed from Legacy of Darkness because it would respawn after you reloaded a save. And it was right behind a door that you had to walk through with the second nitro. So there was a non-zero probability of getting sucker punched from behind your head by a by a suit of armor that was just there. And that you had no reason to expect would be there. 
So they just removed that 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 that, that one from the. Oh. I keep forgetting that <laughs> these guys are still. The two dogs and the gardener just are just in the hedge maze for the for the rest of the level now. They they never go away and you never defeat them or anything. They're just there. They're a drain resources if you fuck around for too long. Yeah. You have to go through the hedge maze once to unlock the copper door. And from this side of the copper door, you have the option to unlock the other door, which is closer to the entrance of the hedge maze um, from the inside. But there's no reason to unlock it from the inside, at least not in Reinhardt's playthrough, because you have everything you need to finish the level now. Um, in Cornell's playthrough, it's a bit different because they have like a, a Resident Evil style two crest lock key item that you need to get before you can enter the tomb. One of the nifty changes that they made to this level is that when you're playing as Reinhardt and Carrie, you can see that crest item already inserted into the door. It just wasn't there in the original game because there was no Cornell, like, campaign to reference. But, yeah, that square in the door, that's the key item that you need to get as Cornell. That's neat. I like neat details in games like that. Anyway, so, like, survival horror influences are great. I like horror games. I like horror... I like games that take cues from horror games. I I, I especially like it. Well, do you fancy yourself a horror connoisseur even in, uh, like, today's generations? Like, do you play horror games that are released today? Or do you, are you just talking specifically from, like, the 90s and early aughts? <laughs> I was actually just leading up to a point. This boss fucking scared me the first time. Oh, okay. <laughs> they really took uh, influence from the horror games of the time when they were designing this game, and I appreciate that, because what a lot of people don't, like, give Castlevania due credit for, like, I'm talking the original NES Castlevania, is that it was one of, if not maybe the first game, to use horror imagery. You know? Uh, the only other one that comes to mind is Ghosts and Goblins, uh, which definitely has always leaned more cartoony. I think Ghosts and Goblins came. I think Ghosts and Goblins came after Castlevania, but I'm not sure. Uh, no, it was a no. Ghosts and Goblins is pretty the, old. Yeah. yeah, or close to it. But you know, it's again, those are the only two I can really think of on the NES. And like I said, uh, Ghosts and Goblins definitely is always had a more light-hearted tone than um i mean you're literally running around in your underwear so you know <laughs> not that castlevania is a serious business all the time but it's certainly you know there's there's steps to these things uh ghosts and goblins predates castlevania by a year okay i think ghosts and goblins um it um it leaned more into medieval fantasy though yeah this is definitely much more like uh late 1800s more Gothic horror. Gothic horror, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Anyway, this was the part that scared me. The second boss just springing up into the camera as a jump scare. Jesus. Anyway, the female vampire is acrobatic as hell. <laughs> I was going to say, what was with that Olympic jump there? Look at her go. <laughs> yeah, she looks like she's just trying to go for the gold, and the, the stupid Transylvanian judge won't give her any credit. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, that's cheating. Thankfully, the, the, the other female vampires that you run into that, 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 are, that are similar to this don't have the mist form that this one does, because this mist form wastes a lot of time. Mist. I mean, I mean, yeah, the mist form is kind of kind of lame, you know, like turn into a wolf. Cool. Turning into a bat. Cool. Turning into mist. OK, cool. I I walk through like a door or like through some spikes. And it's like you would have fought Galabov. OK, add another to the counter. Legacy of Cain did mist form perfectly. All right. Because like in Blood Omen 1, f you can just turn to mist any time and physical attacks will just phase right through you, you know? I mean, there's ways to make it cool. I just don't think Symphony of the Night made it cool. <laughs> no, it didn't, unfortunately. Um. So when you're fighting the vampire, does any hit give you the vampire status, or do you have to specifically be bitten? You have to specifically be bitten. And, okay, um, that's good. I didn't figure this out until later playthroughs, but you can wiggle the analog stick to break three before the vampirism takes. Oh, so interesting. So it's actually fairly easy to escape having to cure vampirism at all. But um, 
It's more of a challenge of uh, how alert you are. Yeah. But keep a few purifying on you just in case, you know. 